5. The Teaching Story, Part 2 Until very recently, as you will see if you have read books on human cultures and have any acquaintance with existing groups, including religious and psychological ones, human institutions have tended to be what can only be called restrictive. That is to say, although they want to increase information and to develop capacities, they leave great areas unstudied. There is a disposition to assume that certain attitudes must not be taken up in their particular system, otherwise such attitudes might threaten the stability or even the very life of the sacrosanct institution. If you are a lawyer, you will tend to have a legalistic mind. If you have decided that certain things are for the greater social good, you will place an interdict upon working with things which appear to you at the time, at some imagined point in time, to militate against that good. The unenlightened search of the social good tends to be restrictive. The result of this narrowing of the thinking is to make the person involved in it less effective, more mechanical, more prone to look for systems. In the West, in spite of its tradition of restless exploration, we find so much folklore connected with the belief that everything is in fact examined that it can be difficult to explain that there are things which the West does not think about. Again and again we see that people trained within Western dogmas of all kinds try, when we get deeply into things, to relate everything which is being put forward in terms of a dogma which is already held in their minds. Even in psychology, where things have to be rendered in the frameworks of, say, Freud or Jung, or interpersonalism, the desire for system as understood by dogmatists is accompanied by, or perhaps underlies, a powerful desire to establish, by association or interpretation, similarities with what they already think. This compulsion is partly, I am sure, rooted in a basic desire for order. It is also a symptom of not having shaken off the suffocating attitude of the Middle Ages, where everything had to fit in with a received and uniformalist view. This attitude accompanied the last two phases of human panacea thinking, where the neo-medieval systems of the Age of Reason and the Age of Technology were as restrictive and as unfruitful as the religio-scholastic one which they affected to replace. Here is the very sharp distinction between the Sufi attitude and these compulsively pattern-seeking ones. Pattern-seeking In the pattern-seeking approach, people will look at your materials to see which of their preconception systems they accord with. Hence, say, in Victorian British books on the Sufis, they are often represented as close to English gentlemen or sometimes as ignorant savages. Work done in the Age of Reason emphasises the Sufis as people of rationality. The people of the Age of Technology, naturally, are greatly pleased to find that Sufis are so modern. Today, this is one of their most frequent remarks about Sufi matters. Now, the effect of all this is that in every age, only one or two possible versions of what the Sufis are is revealed, like people feeling the elephant in the dark. The result of all this is, of course, that by the time you have worked through all the possible interpretations of what the Sufi way is, according to your current and local lights, it will have taken you many centuries. Furthermore, when it is established to the satisfaction of the investigator that Sufism is, shall we say, a form of Neoplatonism or of anti-clericalism or of psychology or education, he will heave a great sigh of relief. The last word has been said on the subject, the investigator can go to sleep again, having done his little bit towards making the world more comfortable by putting yet another piece of unexplained material into its duly labelled box. The answer of the people to whom this is said, by the way, is that unless we do as best we can to reinterpret, say, Sufism, within the framework of contemporary knowledge, updating when we can, everything would be chaos, and there would be license for people to be as woolly-headed as they liked, and science and civilization would break down.
There are only two things wrong with this argument, both of them destroying it. The first is that the Sufis for a very considerable time have been among the most advanced people in being able to display efficiency of thought and action and all the things that conventional achievers like to think about and pride themselves on. This is because the Sufis can demonstrate that another mode of thinking does not destroy the mechanical, which takes its proper place as a subordinate, not a sovereign one. The intellect is not sovereign. Knowledge is. The other error is to assume that, say, the Sufi approach might not have solved the very difficulty in which you are, that it might actually be the answer to the problem which is so often expressed as, how can we think about one thing in two different ways, or of two things at once? Sufis do make this claim, and they are not likely to abandon it, central as it is to their whole orientation. After all, it works. So we are, in fact, offering far more than most people interested in us are likely to want. Sufis do not offer to tinker with someone's horse and cart if they are in the business of teaching locomotion. In this central discussion, the Sufi teaching story has a vital place. Instead of spending generations looking at things from the points of view of successive dogmas, the Sufi approach is to look at the materials, in this case the stories, successively, if you like, but from every point of view. This is why, of course, Sufis were using, centuries ago, what people today with whoops of joy identify as Freudian, Jungian, and such-like attitudes. They discovered, and who would not if this approach were used, the various possible attitudes towards human behaviour, and researched them without becoming hypnotised into the belief that these postures might be right as they discovered them, and building schools of belief upon them. Didactic prevents understanding This is because the Sufis learned very early that far from it being useful to adopt one theory after another in psychology and education, it was only after as rapidly as possible exhausting the limits by study that they could get at the truth beyond. When you have run out of theories, you will find fact. When didactic has been worked through, you get understanding. For this reason, we can clearly see the value of the exhaustive method of working with stories that I am about to outline. The Sufi practice is to take a number of tales and ask a group of people to look at them. They then have to note down the points which interested them in the stories. Instead of magnetising themselves upon those points, they have to set them aside and look at the points that did not catch their attention and ask themselves why they missed these. What censorship or lack of understanding was operating? People first make their notes separately, then study them in unison, so that everyone taking part is possessed of all the reactions of the others. In this way, a mosaic is built up. People all contribute, one to the other's understanding. Now a Sufi teacher goes through the results and indicates the points which nobody has noticed which are then fed back into the minds of the group, which is able to add to its individual and collective knowledge the material which it could not provide from among its own members. When this process has been completed, one may expect a dramatic improvement in the understanding capacity of all the people involved. This is what we regard as proper teaching and learning. First you do what you can, then you profit from what others are doing, and they from you. Finally, you get the additional element which was absent from your own knowledge stock, provided by your teacher. You may care to contrast this method with that of, say, theological didactic. Only the other day I visited a religious building where the cleric had so far lost the thread of teaching in any, to me, identifiable form, that he was haranguing about twenty old ladies on the need to give up pornography and obscenity in their lives. He was, of course, talking to himself. But what were the qualifications, what was the insight of this teacher at that moment? We have in earlier pages covered no less than eighty points ranging over the need to prepare, 
The absence of necessary postures before understanding teaching stories can properly come about. The often very trivial barriers which prevent our making use of this great treasure of knowledge. These 80 statements often overlap, and some are parts of others. The published collections of tales in themselves constitute teaching frames which make it possible to deal with some of the barriers oneself, but the purpose and existence of the instructional role and mandate is central to the whole enterprise. There are limits beyond which the familiarization and feedback system ordinarily employed in study cannot operate without the active assistance of an instructor who is a real, not a self-appointed one. Sufis do not insist on the primacy of the teaching function because they want to, but because they must. It is, indeed, the Sufi's objective to render the teaching function obsolete, but first he, or she, must make available the information and the methods which are not to be found yet, for practical purposes, among the generality of the people who want to learn. The Sufi enterprise, in which the stories can play an essential part, is to operate in areas which have been neglected. This is the Sufi contribution towards the vision of a better world.